but but one of the reasons one does a differential diagnosis, I mean, why would you bother? Uh, one of the reasons you do it is because it's meant to give you some information about outcome. Uh, what is the projected outcome for these two distinct disorders, if they are distinct? Um, and what's quite interesting when you look at the literature is that in autism, we've been, we're not, and apart from a few rather quirky people, we're not talking about cures. Uh, we're actually thinking about what do these people look like at various stages in their life with their autism. And we find that it's very dependent on the degree of learning disability that occurs in autism. And my colleague Gillian Baird and her other colleagues found that about 55% of people with, diagnosed with autism will have an intellectual disability at some degree. Language competence and age of acquisition is very predictive of outcome. 75, and this is something I think is really important. About 75% of children with ASDs will be verbal. They will develop language as a normal course of their ASD. Um, broader spectrum disorders do better than core autism. And factors such as anxiety, personality, behaviour, resilience are very important in terms of outcome, as they are with everybody, but perhaps a bit more so in ASD. Interestingly, if you look at the literature on outcome in, in SLI, it is thinking about who resolves and who doesn't. So it, it is a different feel. Um, and about 60% of children with expressive language delay only spontaneously resolve by the time they're about five or six. 87% um, of children, however, with a receptive language difficulty continue to have problems. So there does seem, although in the new guidelines maybe they're not going to be separated, there does seem to be a difference. Um, pathway for these children. And there's a good evidence that if language problems persist beyond this sort of age of around five, um, five, six, then um, other problems are identified, social difficulties, literacy problems, and in Gina's um, following on of her studies, um, only uh, 50, well, just over half the children who had been in a language unit with an SLI early on still met criteria, but that's because they have other emerging difficulties and specificity is no longer there. Uh, I've highlighted, there were lots of other areas there, but 5% now scoring for ASD at 11 and 28% having a, a falling IQ, therefore losing their specificity. And only 8% resolving, even in the context of a language unit. So this is referring to some of Dorothy's work, which I'm sure most of us can be doing throughout the day. Um, some very interesting work thinking about what, was, what they were calling diagnostic substitution. The fact that um, if you apply current assessment processes for ASD to a population of children either diagnosed with pragmatic language impairment or SLI, there was quite a big range, but 40 to 95 percent of individuals with PLI met ASD criteria, depending on where you set your boundaries, and 0 to 33 percent of children with uh, individuals with SLI met criteria. And this wasn't just a matter of becoming more autistic as you get older, because the ADI looks at symptoms in early childhood. And um, what that, what, not only does it mean that, um, that, that there may not be this distinction, very easily made, but also it means that when we look at literature on outcome and treatment response, many of those individuals diagnosed as having language impairment were actually be people who had ASD. So does, so this is where I'm trying to get you, so does differential diagnosis matter? Well, it could be important for research because we do want to know how individuals do and how they respond to treatment. It does have implications for prognosis and it should have implications for treatment and treatment response. But the problem is that when you're a clinician and a little bod walks into your clinic, what you see is a child and they don't have a label on them. And so any individual who sees that child is going to be thinking, what could it be? Because the presenting behavior could be, uh, could be a behavior problem, it could be separation anxiety, it could be um, failure to communicate, it could be um, all sorts of things. And depending on your professional background, <coughs> and that's actually very important, um, you may be diagnosing any of these um, uh, things. And the other thing I just want to bring up, this is by a, this is a pretend graph, it's not actually based on real data, but my colleague Hilary Cass wanted to indicate the normal trajectory for a child <coughs> with autism who does not have a learning difficulty. I just want to highlight very quickly that um, on the y-axis, that severity, you get, you get in a young age, severe problems with language, social communication, but some attention, 
And then the normal pattern, if you don't have a learning difficulty, is that your language usually gets better in middle childhood and may come into average level. This is the point at which most children are put into a language unit, just as their language skills become normal. And at the same time, they um, have di may, may be diagnosed as <coughs> having DCD, developmental coordination disorder, because that is the discrepant skill at that age. It would merit a differential diagnosis because it's the skill that's most severely impaired. But that's if you're an OT and you see them at six and you haven't seen them throughout. Oh, I didn't mean that to happen. Um, and attention is in there too. So when we see children at eight and nine, they could very easily have had a diagnosis of language delay, um, ADHD and DCD but actually they've got autism spectrum disorder and this is what happens. And I haven't done it, but wouldn't it be interesting to do the same profile for SLI? I think it'd be very interesting. So, can we identify who to treat? How are we doing? One minute. <laughs> Shoot. Okay, so there's good research from phenology that has been able to highlight indicators for a persistent problem versus a non-specific problem. Can we do the same with, a, with language impairment? No, actually, because what we seem to see is that the children who have more of a problem have a more pervasive difficulty, not more specific. Um, can we treat uh, children early on? Well, um, we can do something about some aspects in the autism literature, but all of us, and this includes my study here, we can't change autism. We can't, we're not being good at that. If you look at PECS, that can increase use immediately, but the benefits are not maintained after the intervention stops. So short-term preschool intervention is not preventative of later problems. And the literature on language interventions is about the same. You can't give children a shot of therapy early on and avoid later problems if they um, are not going to resolve spontaneously themselves. Um, okay, so that's just highlighting those things. Um, are inter later interventions any better? Well, there actually is some evidence that um, interventions that are occurring with later children um, can make some difference, and, but generally to the children with expressive language difficulties rather than receptive language difficulties. Parent-child interaction therapy with slightly older children can make a difference. Um, there was a big study um, in Middlesbrough looking at intervention for children, um, and it was an RCT and there was a waiting list control. They were not very impaired, there were only one standard deviation below the mean, very broad age range. I think about 70%, 60 something percent of the children were below five, but they found that children with speech disorders made most progress, and um, children with comprehension expressive problems did just as well, well, there was a slight improvement in treatment, but neither of them reached age uh, expected norms. Um, and Susan's were with a very specific intervention with these older children, focusing on a particular area. You can teach competence with these slightly older children in the particular area that you focus on. So very, very quickly, in about 30 seconds, I, what I would like to propose, or I'd like us to think about, is what population, given our very limited resources, should we be, be focusing on? Can we identify that 1% early on? Because the bottom dollar with the 1% is they're not going to get better on their own. So we, perhaps we should be working early with them. But the 7%, we don't really want to be spending resources working with under fives who are going to get better on their own. That would be, in my view, a waste of resource. And particularly because it's at the expense of older children. So these are quotes that I hear from speech and language therapy uh, colleagues. Um, they tell me that their managers say, don't spend too much time assessing, just get them into therapy, off our waiting list and into our groups. We, can, we can't provide intensive treatment for anybody. Uh, we can't provide ongoing interventions. You're going to get your six weeks and then you're not going to get anything for a while. And we don't see children under five. There are some districts now saying they won't see children under five. On the basis of, um, over five. On the basis of no evidence whatsoever, in my view, that that is um, a good age to concentrate on. So current clinical situation, people tend to screen referrals, they don't do full assessments, one or two subtests, not necessarily the same test, lots of informal observation and parental concern. Um, treatment decisions based on what's available. And so you get plopped into a phonology group maybe, parent-child intervention, or an early education provision, but are they generic or are they specific? Well, they're generally generic. And therefore, why bother diagnose? Because you're going to put them into parent-child intervention anyway. 
Um, there are some specific, I don't know, I'm just going to throw it all out there. Um, there are some specific interventions such as pets, specific to a population with a particular function, but it's so rarely taught well because it's, people don't have enough time to do it. And as we know, it's not a pill. You need to continue with it or the skill isn't, isn't maintained. So, so, can we provide tailored intervention based on differential diagnosis and predictive response to treatment? And is early intervention at the expense of older children with more significant impairments who, once they get beyond six, get very, very little? But they are the ones who are not going to spontaneously resolve. We know that by now.